Thanks. Um, so it's called PathGL. It's uh, basically just a D3 adapter for WebGL, or WebGL adapter for D3. Um, oh. Sorry, this one is the... Yeah, so I'll talk into this one. Uh, thanks. Um, so yeah, there was this quote like a week ago that I saw that was really good. Um, I don't know if you can read it. It's, it goes, uh, D3 performance limitations are good for the Viz community. Uh, I can't imagine a world in which everyone commits the excess that I do. Um, this guy's like, he posts really good stuff. You should look at it. Um, so that's basically what PathGL is. It's a tool for uh, excessive stuff. Um, but, I mean, at its core, it's just like a, it's like a virtual DOM. So it's kind of like uh, Facebook's React. Just instead of, uh, instead of like spinning out strings and doing inner HTML, it, uh, it does WebGL commands. Um, and there's like two big reasons we want to do that. Uh, the biggest one is just you want to like draw lots of stuff really fast. Um, that's kind of cool. But uh, the, the bigger one, in my opinion, is the uh, doing uh, GP, GPU uh, as a first class citizen. And that's basically running like, or offloading big computations off to your uh, graphics card. Um, and there's just a lot of stuff that it's actually uh, really good at that you don't really want to do on your CPU. Um, the first one is like image processing, which you would probably use in like a visualization for like visual effects. Um, I mean, it's not that useful for visualization because like you want it to be like simple, but um, I mean, you should be able to do it if, if you need to or you want to. Um, so yeah, like things like glows and blurs and uh, procedural textures, things like that look like smoke or water, stuff like that. Um, the second one is like uh, scientific computing or like physics simulations, uh, fluid dynamics, um, anything you do like high performance computing stuff for, um, stuff that used to be on like CUDA, you can, you can kind of port CUDA to uh, WebGL now. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you don't have, and it, it's like a lot more hacky, but it, it works. Um, and the third one, which is like what I'm really focusing on now, is uh, like processing uh, visual queries on the graphics card so that you can uh, load like huge data sets and uh, kind of brush through them and interact with them in real time. Um, so there's like two kinds of uh, visualization. Um, one of them is like presentation, and that's where like you know what you're doing, you know what you're presenting, you know what you're talking about. Um, and uh, for that kind of thing, WebGL isn't that useful, actually, because like, you just want it to be like, simple and you want to communicate the information with as little fluff or noise as possible. Um, but there's another kind of visualization called like, exploration, um, where you're kind of just putting it on a front end for maybe a big data warehouse or like a database or something. Um, and you don't really know like, what the person wants. You, you just want to create a tool that lets people uh, kind of figure out what they need. Um, and one of the big libraries for doing that kind of stuff is uh, uh, Crossfilter, which was by, by, by uh, Mike Bostock. Um, you can, there's like coordinated views and you can like brush through them and kind of filter the data in, in multiple dimensions. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, but it kind of falls over on like bigger data sets. And um, there was like a really great paper like a few months ago uh, called Immense. And it's about like doing, like after about like a million data points, uh, Crossfilter starts to kind of die. Um, uh, Jeffrey here showed, showed how to do a, uh, the same thing, but like with a billion data points. Um, this is like check-ins on, I think it's like Foursquare or something, something like Foursquare. It's just, it's just like a location check-in. Um, and the left is like the state of the art. That's like Google's uh, fusion charts. Um, and the way, what they do is they actually have like, a, they use like these really complex filtering methods. Um, and there's like a lot of drawbacks to that. First of all, it's like, it's hard to get right. Um, they're taking like a, they're basically slicing the data and then trying to give like a representative sample. Um, but the biggest problem with that is that uh, it actually like it clobbers out the uh, the anomalies that you really want to see, uh, like the things the things that are like kind of weird and don't really fit your model. That's um, that's like what you want to see the most, right? Um, so this there's a different method called uh, aggregated binning. Um, and instead of taking a slice of the world, you split up the world into like different buckets, um, and then you can count within those buckets to get uh, to get like the value or the point. Um, and you can see on like the right side, it's like a lot higher resolution in terms of uh, what you can see. Like there's this little, um, I don't know if you can see it in the web back, but there's this like little line. Um, and that's like Hurricane Ike or something. Somebody was like made, made a fake account to like track um, where the hurricane was. Um, you can see like, you know, highways and stuff. Um, and this one you kind of just see like there's, you know, there's cities and that's cool. But um, here you, there's like Canada, there's like stuff happening in Mexico. So it's like, uh, it's just more better information. Um, and another, another thing they do besides just binning, they, they, uh, they split up the data into tiles. So like the way Google Maps works is that instead of, like it looks like a seamless world that you can like go up and down in all three directions. Um, but actually it's just like tiles. And uh, 
you can do the same thing with any kind of information. It doesn't have to be geospatial data. Like it can be uh, check-ins. I mean, I guess check-ins are geospatial, but like, yeah, it could be any. You could you could basically split up your data into across any dimension and do the same uh, effect. Um, but doing that kind of thing without like libraries is kind of hard. Um, so that's kind of the goal right now. And uh, I want to show two quick demos. Um, so here's like a physics simulation um, with uh, D3. And like to prove it, I can like uh, I can open the console and like change the color to like pink and white, I think. Um, and it still like moves around and follows your cursor and stuff. Um, and the code is really simple. Um, I mean, this is kind of like a it's just a dumb demo, but uh, basically we just create like a particle texture. And um, like a texture, people think it's like an image, but it can actually be. Um, you can also just like create a, uh, a shader and basically redraw to the texture every frame, and that'll be like a. It's a text. It's still a texture. It's just a container of like video memory. So um, you know the way you like handle it can be uh, different. Um, so yeah, you can like pass like check-ins as a texture maybe, or you could pass in um, any kind of data. Um, here we're actually just passing like a shader, which is like a program that runs on the GPU to the texture. Um, and then we pass it to D3, and it basically creates like a, I think 200,000 circles or something. And these little d.x's, these little uh, functional operators, uh, they point to like different locations in the texture for each particle. Um, and this is just regular like a fill function. It looks just like normal D3. And then whenever we move our cursor, it just like emits particles if it's um, if it's ready to do that. Um, so yeah, it should work for like any kind of computation. It could work for like FFT or um, like smoke simulations or wh whatever you want, really. Um, another example that that's kind of closer. Um, this is a uh, let's see. Let me refresh real quick. This is like a map of like all the historical events um, that are on like Wikipedia. Um, let's see if it. Uh, it's coming. You know, it's kind of slow. Or, I mean, it's, I'm actually tethering on my phone, so that's probably why it's slow. Okay, cool. I, I have it up. Um, so yeah, it's basically there's like 10,000 uh, circles on the screen, but you can't see them because uh, we're only looking at this amount. And you can actually like filter. Across. I mean, there's only two dimensions, but you can like filter all of them and like look at them all at the same time. Um, you can get like a smaller slice, and you can see like around let's say 1,700. There's like an explosion that comes in like America, which is kind of cool. And then you can like click on them and see whatever happened. And that looks like it's like over here. Uh, some guy was baptized by John. And yeah, it just goes on and then it eventually stops. Um, so that's all just like regular D3 and uh, WebGL stuff. I mean, I had this in SVG before and it was like really slow and hard to um, watch. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the syntax is basically just you can take in any attribute, you can pass a texture to it, and uh, it'll, it'll shadow that attribute and it'll point to the right location in uh, the video card. Um, and so I want to talk about how like, the particle simulation actually works. Um, so a texture is just like an image, right? Um, and a pixel is basically just like a four element array um, with like four channels, uh, RGBA. Um, but we can actually, if we represent those as like uh, position and velocity, and then like we rewrite to the same texture over and over again, and like read from the same texture every frame, we can actually like pass state um, to like the graphics card, even though it's like massively parallel and it's supposed to be stateless. You can pass state between frames and like have a living simulation kind of thing. Um, and like whenever you emit particles, that's just writing directly to the texture from the CPU. So data can go from the CPU to the GPU, but it can't really go from the GPU to CPU. I mean, it can, but it's like just way slower. So. Um, that's kind of a limitation. Um, so yeah, the, the graphics card is um, it's like massively parallel. Um, we're basically just saying render a picture of 1,000 uh, pixels wide and uh, tall. And that's going to be like a million threads. And those million threads will execute like every single frame. Um, and it's still 60 frames on like a MacBook Air. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, it's, there's no like iOS support in WebGL, which kind of sucks. Um, Plus VG support is like coming. It's not quite there yet. There's a lot of attributes that aren't um, in, but like that's all documented. You can look at the uh, documentation, and that's all like listed out. Um, and CSS support is is like in progress. It works for like if you have the CSS inlined um, in a style tag, but it doesn't work for like uh, off location stuff. So um, yeah, uh, questions or comments or objections. So what would be the limits of SVG? 
Is it not access, no access to the GPU or? Uh, what, what do you mean? So what are, the, what are going to be the differences with SVG and? Um, well, eventually, I, it should get to the point where there's no differences. I'm not. Maybe that's like. Performance. I mean, performance. Uh, it should like be like 100 times faster. -ish. I don't know. I mean, it really depends what you're doing. In SVG. Um, like, do you mean WebGL versus SVG or? You tell me. I'm okay, so yeah, it's it's basically like the way the uh, thing works. Like, it looks just like SVG, but it's actually. I mean, at least in terms of like the D3 layer, it's kind of like F SVG, but um, it's just creating like a WebGL. Um, buffers and stuff. Um, right now, like the coordinates are right, and like the, you can use most of the same attributes and the same elements. There's a lot of stuff that's like missing. Like, I mean, the, a lot of the obscure stuff will take a while to get in because like nobody really uses it. Um, like use tags or like filter SVG filters. Like those are like using an SVG blur is super slow, so nobody ever uses them. And there's actually ways to do it in WebGL that's like way nicer and cleaner and stuff that you'd probably want to use instead. Um, so that might take a little bit longer. I mean, eventually I'll probably just put it in just because it's just for completeness sake. Any wild guesses for how long before it grows this Um, no, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, anyone else, sir? Yes. Uh, are you like uh, adding properties or attributes that are, aren't native to SVG but are just convenient to add because of the way you do it? Um, you could do that. I found that it got kind of unwieldy really quickly. Um, yeah, I might add like a vertex method that like lets you bind like an array to uh, as an attribute or something. Um, yeah. Do you have a team? Uh, no. Um, I mean, kind of. I don't know. Not really. <laughs> I have a team that I have people who help me find lots of bugs, pretty much. And most of those are. I mean, we haven't had huge game breaking breaking bugs in like a while. Um, any more questions there? Do you have a background in 3D with new things? Um, not really. I mean, this is just 2D, so there might be like 2.5D support later on, like a camera. Well, I'm just thinking, like, for, for, for people like me who, who have never dabbled in anything 3D, like, you know, I, I don't know what a shader is, I don't know what a pixel, um, sorry, I, I don't know what a particle is, right? So, what do you recommend for, for people that have never touched it before to learn something like this? Um, I really like this website called uh, glslheroku.com. It's basically it's all about shaders. Um, hopefully, that's like the only thing that should be exposed. I think. Uh, at the D3 layer, yeah, there's just like crazy, this is like a 30-line program and it's like does, or I guess it's more than three lines. But yeah, it's like, here's like a ray tracer and it like does insane stuff. There's, this is probably the best way to learn and like you can edit the code and like it changes instantly and I basically just spent lots of time on this website and learned that stuff. Um, yes. Are you doing uh, what, event detection? Uh, yeah, so. There's two different ways to do it. You can do like CPU intersection tests, and that works. That's actually better um, for stuff that you're not animating on the GPU. Um, but a lot of stuff does get animated on the GPU, like particles. You're not going to be able to do intersection tests because like the, the CPU doesn't know where it is. Um, yeah. So there's a second way of doing it where you can like render the screen onto an off-screen location, and then you can uh, basically give every single element like a different color, and then you can say, okay, okay what's the color at this point? And that's your guy, and then you submit an event, um, and it's kind of like yeah, it reacts synthetic events. It's like the same thing. Um. So you basically D three selections are now basically operations on textures. Is that? Um, no, no, no. There's there's like uh, WebGL attributes, or there's WebGL buffers that like are just lists of points, and when you do when you call attribute on something, it'll It'll write to that uh, list. Well, I'm talking about like if uh, do you have exit like a dot exit and dot enter? Yeah, those answer? all work, and selectors work too. Oh, um, yes. I think te textures are only done in like data joins, um, and you can say you can make the attribute of like an exposition of a circle, um, like a, a coordinate in the texture, and that'll that'll be its output. Any, anyone else? This might be a stupid question, but how are you selecting an element on a canvas? Um, basically, we create like a, like a list of, again, basically an array of objects that represent um, DOM elements, and then they can have properties, and like you just rip up, you just take the selector and traverse the array. I mean, it's it's probably kind of slow now if you're doing like a million stuff because there's no like caching and it's not there's no tree. Um, it's just like a flat iteration, but. Uh, 
yeah, eventually that'll probably be like cached and faster and stuff. Um, yeah, or, yeah. Sorry. You said it was the D3 that doesn't work on iOS? Uh, D3 works fine on iOS. It's uh, WebGL that doesn't have support on iOS. It's actually in like iAds. Um, so I think they're just like testing it out, making sure that the support is, um, or making sure that there's no like, you know, crashes or whatever. So like if an iAd breaks, it's not going to break your whole phone or your whole app. It's just going to be this tiny little sliver at the top. Um, so I'm kind of optimistic that they're just collecting performance data before they're actually turning it on. But um, yeah, right now you can't use them. Uh, floating point textures do not work on Android. So this physics, thing, physics simulation doesn't work. Um, but yeah, like if you're just if you're not doing, if you're not writing to a texture um, as a simulation, then it should work. Um, so like you can do, you can load like giant data sets and still still be able to filter them. Um, that should still work. Um, okay, cool. Uh, thanks. <laughs>